Since the U.S. Supreme Court last week gutted affirmative action in college admissions, a Boston civil rights group is challenging Harvard University's admissions practices. The group contends that legacy admissions, which constitutes individuals uh, who have uh, family members who graduated from that particular school, giving them a leg up in admissions, uh, they are saying that discriminates against students of color, the lawyers for civil rights on behalf of black and Latino community groups in New England, filed the civil rights complaint alleging that Harvard's practice of giving priority to the children of alums violates the 1964 Civil Rights Act. The move comes in the wake of the Supreme Court recent decision that was dealing with a Harvard case where uh, a white man, Ed Bloom, sued on behalf of Asian Americans, alleging they were discriminated against due to affirmative action. Now, many of us have talked about legacy and what it means and how actually more people are discriminated against due to legacy. Legacy doesn't just impact Harvard, it's all uh, universities all across the country. Very few actually have outlawed legacy admissions. This, folks, again, is significant. Now, the civil rights complaint draws attention to Harvard's data, revealing that being a legacy student increases the likelihood of admissions uh, to a Harvard, with 70% of legacy applicants being white. The complaint urges the U.S. Department of Education to declare the practice illegal and force Harvard and others to abandon it. Dr. Mustafa Santiago, a lead former senior advisor for environmental justice at the EPA uh, DC, uh, he's with us. The thing here, um, uh, Mustafa, um, that folk have to understand when you look at this particular decision. Uh, you have Asian Americans saying, oh, it's because of affirmative action that not more of us are getting into Harvard. And the data shows, no, it's white folks in legacy that's keeping many of you from getting into Harvard. Yeah, we know legacy is sort of like having a platinum card. It, it helps you to open doors. And when we have these types of situations going on, and many times people just don't understand the dynamics that are happening behind the scenes when decisions are actually being made and they go with these these old antiquated narratives of black folks are getting something or black and brown folks are, are getting something when they're not qualified. So we should make sure we eliminate that by folks understanding that, you know, the students who are applying to these schools um, uh, they have the grades. It is just that they often don't have those leverage points or the privilege to be able to get in when it comes to, you know, uh, in relationship to, to our folks. So we know legacy uh, gives, um, in many instances, those white students that, that uh, additional leg up, if you will, um, and allows them to get in. And sometimes some studies have even showed when they didn't necessarily meet the requirements. Um, so, you know, putting a spotlight on this is going to be very revealing for folks. Uh, is absolutely going to be revealing. And, and and what you're seeing here, what you're seeing uh, when you have, um, again, Asian Americans making this claim, look, they want to be a part of the elite institutions, but they are elite for a reason. They are white for a reason. And we know exactly what that is. We understand the reality of racism in this country. There's a reason why Harvard has a $40 billion endowment. It's because those white folks have been, by, by going there, getting many of the top jobs, they're able to build up that massive wealth. You cannot escape the reality of wealth and whiteness from Ivy League institutions in America. Yeah, it is power and it is privilege. That's really what the Supreme Court case was about, was about power. We understand that education is supposed to be an opportunity to level the playing field. Um, and once we began to make strides in that particular area, then people began to say, wait a minute, you know, we've got too many black and brown folks who are now beginning to uh, move in the direction of the American dream. Um, and we also understand that the historical uh, aspects that are tied to education were built for white men. Um, and then after long, hard fights, of course, some white women were able to uh, actually move into that space as well. Um, so we see, once again, this is about power and privilege. Um, and, you know, we need our those. Uh, and I want to make sure that we don't put a broad brush on all Asian brothers and sisters, because there are many who do stand in solidarity with our communities. But for that, that percentage that allowed themselves to be used um, to create this very um, devastating situation, 
um, understand that the history was never meant for you or us um, and that we actually need to stand together to make sure that we're dealing with these injustices that are happening from the Supreme Court. Um, uh, this weekend, um, uh, Sherilyn Eiffel was on ABC News uh, this week talking about uh, this very issue of the Supreme Court de decision and why it was so disastrous. Here's what she had to say. Trump justices. Yes, it was. I mean, I think this is what we expected from uh, these justices. We all knew that these cases were coming through the pipeline. And what this court has shown uh, since these justices joined the court is a really aggressive approach to dismantling uh, core and critical issues that have been championed on the, on the progressive left um, and that are really part of the infrastructure of our country, our kind of post-civil rights country. Um, they're moving quickly. Um, I think they're moving in some ways uh, in, in, in a manner that actually undercuts their legitimacy. And they are taking steps at a time when our country is deeply divided that I think will result in further division. I think this affirmative action decision is disastrous, is a mistake, uh, and um, you know we're going to be left with the consequences of it. I want to get to that specifically in a moment, but Jen, first, more than anything, this was a Roberts court. I mean, we had 59 decisions. He was in the majority 55 times, and there were some surprising wins uh, for, for, the, uh, for the liberals on the court. Well, I think that's true. And I actually think this term, actually, there's more consensus than there maybe has been the last several terms and less polarization. Um, and if you look at some statistics put together by some Supreme Court advocates, at least current through the uh, next to last day of the term this year, it was Justice Thomas and Justice Alito who more frequently were in dissent. I think Justice Kagan last term had perhaps over 20 uh, dissents, this term 10 or fewer. And so that suggests that actually the court's not necessarily always aligning how we would expect but they're trying to decide each individual case in accordance with the rule of law as they understand it. So on the affirmative action case, uh, you, you heard uh, in, in Devin's story there, there's an effort from Harvard and from other schools to say, we are continuing our commitment to diversity. We're just going to have to do it in a different way. Well, that's easier said than done. And if you look at um, schools in California, which outlawed affirmative action in 1996, you will see that it is quite challenging. And, you know, it's important to remember the whole point of affirmative action, which is to create this environment uh, where people from all different backgrounds can engage, can do problem solving, can innovate, can learn about each other. Um, and particularly at selective institutions, which, whether you like it or not, tend to be the places from which the nation's leaders uh, emanate. And so if I mean, eight out of nine of the justices went to Harvard or Yale. I'm just saying if these yeah. are the places that are in incubating the leadership of this country, I, I would think at this moment in our country, we would recognize that universities are quite correct, that that incubation has to happen in a way that um, trains leaders who are equipped and prepared to deal with people of different backgrounds, who have been exposed to different perspectives, who have knowledge of uh, lifestyles and ways of thinking that are different than their own. I certainly experienced this when I went to college. I, too, am from Queens, like the uh, young men that were, that were in that segment, uh, you know, youngest of 10 children. And when I went to Vassar College, I learned about a whole different uh, way of life and different worlds. And I like to think that my friends... Uh, many of whom were white and w with whom I was quite close, learned a lot about the life that I led and about different perspectives and that it shaped their lives. So that was the whole point of this. And to have this dismantled, uh, it seems to me, is, is going to be quite, quite difficult. And I think it's quite dangerous, actually, for our democracy at this moment. In what had been the landmark decision, the Bakke decision in 1978, Justice Powell, who was the deciding factor uh, in that decision, said that universities, colleges have a compelling interest in having a diverse student body. Is, is the court now saying, Jen, that there is no longer such a compelling interest? Well, the chief justice's opinion that six justices joined um, said, like, inconsistency with the strict scrutiny standard, that there has to be a compelling interest that's narrowly tailored. And the chief, in his opinion, said that the way in which the interest has been explained here by Harvard and UNC was tough to measure and that there was not any anywhere close in those situations of enough of a nexus. I think the justices also uh, were concerned about, in general, broad-based stereotypes and that Asian Americans in particular had been uh, negatively 
effectively um, facing stereotypes under some of the admissions criteria. And so six justices joined the reasoning saying that uh, there can't be discrimination or separate treatment on the basis of race. It maybe can be looked at as an individual factor if an applicant ties it to other circumstances in their life, but no longer will people be favored on, on the basis of class and race and admissions. <laughs> Well, see, that's difficult because, in fact, this is a holistic admissions process that actually doesn't just look at race isolated and independently, but within the context of many other factors. And I think what I find most disturbing about the, the majority's decision in this case is that in both of these cases, there were trials. There was extensive evidence that was submitted. There were expert witnesses. There were graphs. There were charts. Uh, there were student, uh, students who testified in favor of affirmative action. Um, and after two week, a two-week trial in the Harvard case, we get a decision from a federal court judge, 130 pages. In the UNC case, 155 pages, meticulously going through the information that was submitted, that was vetted, that was subject to cross-examination, and concluded quite the opposite, that in fact, these admissions processes do not discriminate against Asian Americans. Uh, that's the, the way our legal system works, is that we actually subject things to the rigor of trial. We get a a fact-finding decision from the district court as we did in both of these cases. The fact that six justices have a different opinion or a hunch right. about what they think is going on um, is not actually the way the, the legal system is supposed to work. Mustafa, um, I'm going to go to break. When we come back, um, I'm, I want to unpack something here because I need people to understand that those, uh, there's this white fear we're going to talk about in my book. This is not the end. Ed Bloom, he's already made clear they want to go after corporate America next. They want to go after all of the places in our society where uh, they have been advocating on behalf of affirmative action uh, and, and cr increasing opportunities. This is about maintaining whiteness, even if they're using Asian folk to do it.